Years ago, you wouldn't dream of starting a business without a business card. Today, you would need a website. Well, my next guest started his with neither, and he has gotten to the top of his field just by word of mouth and a great reputation. Today, we have the hilarious and talented Stephen Mann from Mann Casting based in Toronto. Mann Casting is a commercial casting office booking thousands of commercials nationwide. He is also a writer, producer, creator, and lover of hip hop. Please welcome my friend, Stephen Mann. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. So to, <laughs> I already gave your spiel and your bio. But do you want to tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you're doing right now and how we met? Okay. Uh, right now, well, I've actually, oh, I've been at home since about March 18th. I have a, uh, I'm a casting director here in Toronto. I have about 4,000 or more square feet of studio space that is being unused, that I haven't used since March. Um, we're doing all of our casting online. Um, I'm here drinking wine, which I do most nights. And... Uh, spend my time in my living room. I mix it up. I go into the kitchen and go into the washroom and just really like to keep it fresh. Um, yeah, so and we met at um, the CMTC, um, uh, I guess it's a, the, the- uh, is, convention. Yeah, the convention. And uh, we met about, what, four years ago, five years ago? Can't believe it's been that long already. Four, five years ago, yeah. And, uh, and we, we just hit love. it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just hit it off. And, uh, I mean, obviously, we haven't been in a, this will be the second year we haven't gone, and I really miss it. It's always a good time, for, especially for casting, because it's local. A lot of it is local. I get to meet a lot of really interesting people that I actually are able to bring in for castings, and, you know, a lot of really cool kids, and it's just, it's like, a, it's like camp. Like, it's always a lot of fun on the weekends. Also for camp for adults, too, because, you know, we do karaoke all night and just hang out and have some drinks and just get to know each other. It's great. I love it. Yeah. So I remember the first time I met you, the thing that you told me was that you don't have a business card and you don't have a website. No. And you run probably like the most successful casting office in your area. So how the hell did you build such a successful company without any marketing? I think it's all relationship driven. I think humor plays a, plays a really big part of it. Um, my mom was a casting director and, and I used to sort of uh, direct sessions for her when I was younger with no real intention of becoming a casting director. I think most people that go into casting kind of somehow fall ass backwards into it. It's not something like you wake up as a little boy and say, I want to be a casting director. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's all relationships. And, uh, you know, the, I don't know, it's really weird. Like I had business cards. I've never used them. They're, they don't have my, my current email on it. I've never needed a website. Like my business, I've been very lucky that it's had growth for, other than COVID, it had, it had grown for 10 years in a row. Um, and uh, there's a lot of really successful casting agencies here in Toronto. Uh, I'm just one of them. And we're very blessed to be working. We're blessed to be working still, even though business is down. But, you know, I'm kind of that old school cat where I feel like good work should merit more work. And if you treat your clients with respect, and if you get an email, you are prompt on the response. Um, it's just being available. We're service providers, right? So we have to be standing by and in production shit happens really fast. And I think that a lot of our clients um, feel safe knowing that if something comes up, we're on it. And it's, it's not just me. It's also Sarah Sheps, who, uh, who is my right arm, who's absolutely incredible and my whole team. Like everybody. You're such really, a good team. Oh my God. I have the best team. I really do. They're, they're really committed and dedicated and eager and great attitude. And and we're all friends. Like one of the things I always say, if it's, if it's not fun, it's just work. And even though we're doing it remotely and, you know, I miss being in the office and, you know, playing jokes on each other and hanging out together and stuff and playing music and just being silly. We, you know, we do it on Zoom and uh, it is what it is for now, right? Yeah. So how did you decide to start man casting? Like what was the first step for you? Because you said you, your mom did it. So then what made you have that push to start your own company? Um, it's weird. Like I'm more of a creative. I grew up, uh, my first sort of real job in the industry was I started working at a big morning, uh, big radio station here in Toronto called Q107. 
And uh, I got like a co-op job when I was in my first year of university. I was at film school in Montreal. And, uh, and I got a job there and I never went back. I loved radio so much. And then I started to work with the morning show and I started to do some on air stuff and just really loving it. And from there I went into uh, uh, TV. I started writing a, a show on the, uh, on the sports network here, like your ESPN. And uh, then I had, you know, I was directing all these casting sessions and I sort of felt like, well, I think I'm really good with talent and, and sort of steering talent and making them feel comfortable. Maybe I'll become a director. <laughs> I explored that as well. I, you know, and then uh, I got a gig writing for uh, some hip hop um, websites. And it's funny, this is actually my biggest regret when I look back at, in my career, it's that there's a, a website called Hip Hop DX and it subsequently has become the biggest hip hop website in the world. And when I was writing for it, I was one of the first staff writers and I was doing it for like, for free. And uh, I had just met my, <clears throat> when I was married, I met my wife uh, at the time and so there was so much going on, I just stopped. And I think to myself, you know, I had really carved out a niche for myself infusing hip hop and comedy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was getting a lot of really good feedback. And again, I never did it for the money. And this is one thing I always say to people, the opportunity far outweighs the, the, the monetary compensation at the time. Like just prove yourself, show that you got what it takes, do what you got to do, be ambitious, be hungry, go on above and beyond. And I did that, but I just dropped the ball because I didn't have time to pursue it. And I was like, you know, I'm doing it for free and I got to make a living. I'm getting married, yada, yada, oh, yada. Pros. Okay, keep going. Yeah. So, so anyways, I just fell half back, you know, I just fell into casting. It was something where I was directing sessions and then, you know, uh, it was really difficult working with my mom as much as I learned so much from her and she was incredible and she actually still is and still works, mm -hmm. but we had a different way. We had a different, um, it was a different dynamic when you have, you know, a mother and son working together and it became right. very, very strange at times. And they were also, you know, being able to see my mom every day was also a wonderful thing too, but we both needed our space. So I kind of pivoted and I went more commercials and she, um, she does a lot of uh, series in Toronto mm -hmm. and uh, she loves it and I just it's I've been all really in the family and your sister's in the business too you know, my dad's a broadcaster so this is really all I knew like I've right. sort of been around in a lot of different ways in the industry trying to find where I fit and sometimes you may not think the fit is going to be there but it just happens and that's why you just got to be really open to it like I know when I was coming up with my mom there there, there was a few casting directors it just wasn't something that I ever felt like I kind of felt like I was selling myself short. And I think with actors, especially, I feel that if they don't necessarily become successful at acting, that it's a failure and it's not. Mm -hmm. Because you can still pursue it, acting and whatever you want to do creatively, you can still do it. You can still publish a book. You can still create a web series or a blog or whatever, but it doesn't have to be your main source of income. There comes a time where necessity calls and, and you got to switch. And I never felt like I still write, I still love writing comedy, but I never felt like a failure, especially when I started to pay my bills. Right. And that's you know? the thing about you too, is you're, and the reason why you're on this podcast is because it's all about people who make things happen on their own. And you're, you do that. Like you have an idea and you just do the idea. Cause I want to talk about the film festival that you did. Like you created this monster of a project. Yeah. Just it's, yeah. I, I get, I get very, um, Ambitious is, is, can be addictive, right? Ambition, right? It's like if you start something and I'm not afraid to fail. I've failed many That's times. That's so important for everybody to yeah. hear. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'd say four or five years ago, I lost a lot of money on my own shoe line. I had created with a partner my own shoe line. And, um, and we went to shows and I was still doing that in conjunction with the casting. And then also at the time I had bought the masters of my favorite Canadian hip hop album and remixed it with the artists. We put it out on Spotify. Uh, the artist's name is Socrates. I, I had so many irons in the fire um, and uh, the shoe thing didn't work out and I did lose a lot of money, but I gained a lot of knowledge and mm -hmm. I'd like to minimize the financial losses if I can. Right. But I've always, you know, sort of attacked something. I've, I've felt something that I feel is, I'm an idea guy and I just go after it. And sometimes it's hard to finish everything. You've got this idea and you're like, you're writing for like three days and all of a sudden you're, you know, you're drinking wine on the couch playing the PlayStation. So you've got to really stick it through and it, it's difficult, the creative process, but I don't quit. And I always, I always like to, to try different things. I think it's important. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing for people to hear is that you are going to fail at some point and 
like it's just a matter of you'd rather try it and do it and then you learn so much from that experience to go to the next project so There's a lot of lessons to be learned when you fail especially the lessons where you don't repeat those same mistakes and sometimes we have to make those mistakes in order to see um mm -hmm. You know, I was new at a lot of things. Uh, the film festival was something that I just did on a whim and it was, uh, it took on a life of its own. I mean, we were just like COVID had just started, right? It was like the end of March and the office was shut down. And, you know, when it was new, like right now we're all just fucked. We're all exhausted. It's like, I mean, I don't, I know it's kind of weird where you are. You're in the United States. I'm in Canada, I'm in Toronto. But, uh, you know, it, it, at first there was just a lot of fear and there was so much unknown and there still is. And I just felt such a community vibe on social media. People were, Zoom was new. Like we didn't realize how easy it was to actually communicate, you know, it's like- great. I didn't know what Zoom was until the pandemic. Like I had no idea what it was. Right. It's crazy. I mean, we used to like Skype at one time was like a big thing, but it's impossible right. to fucking log into Skype. Nobody knows the <laughs> password, right? And it's like, you know, Skype is the MySpace of teleconferencing. Like it just doesn't, so, you know, we did, discovered that. And I was just part of a lot of like acting classes. I just got really immersed in the community because I found it to be a very supportive system, you know, a community, like everybody was hurting, but we we're all sharing ideas. And, you know, I had this idea about doing this isolation film festival because we we're all in isolation. Um, we didn't use that word anymore, like really isolation, you know, because, it's weird. And, and, and the wheels started to move and all of a sudden it just took on a whole life of its own. And it went from one person, which was me thinking I do it on zoom to, you know, a major sort of online production where we had directors in New York and we had to write it. And, you know, we made a lot of mistakes because it had never been done to this day out of all well, the, when online I watched it, it looked like the most, like it was so well produced. It, it looked like well the Emmys or the Grammys. Like it was, it was, so amazing and that's to the team that you know you know shout out to, to will chang and jessica martin and, and jess moran and there's so many people to name but everyone just we all did it for free we put our own money in wow a lot and it was really exciting to get emails from like parents saying like my kids made their first movie and thank you and we feel so motivated and listen it was a really tough undertaking because <clears throat> it started like i'm sitting here with a glass of wine with this idea all of a sudden I've got 900 films and I have no time to review them. And then we're hiring volunteers to, remo to review them so that the judges can grade them. And certain films got in that shouldn't have got in. And I, it, there was all kinds of stuff that happened. But at the end of the day, if you look at the production values of this online program, that's what I'm most proud of and hosting it that I didn't pass out. Those are the things that I was most proud of. I was beyond blown away. And you're gonna do it again, obviously, right? I don't know, I mean- You should. Well, here's the thing. At the time, like this whole COVID isolated shit, it was so new mm -hmm. and it was so scary. Now it's just scary because there's variants and we're just like fatigued. But that fear that first appeared where it's like, what the fuck is a global pandemic? Like, really? Right. We had heard of SARS and we had heard of other things, but nothing like this. And it was jarring and everybody's business was closed down and everybody was like locked in their houses, afraid to, to touch things. Like people are spraying their fucking groceries and like it was fucked I'm up. I'm laughing, but it's so true and scary. I don't mean to right? like, it's Mexico not normal, food. right. But don't take Advil, you'll die. It's like, what are you talking about? Like I got inflammation in my shoulder. What do you want me to do? Ah. So there was, and that's what made it so special. And we always said, the whole team said, it's like a time capsule. And like, would I be willing to put the work in again? Yes, but is this the right thing to do? I don't know, because it was like a once in a lifetime thing and God willing, this shit never happens again. Right, I get that. You no, know? and, and that's sort of what made it so special was the energy at the time and the process of creating it under those circumstances. Um, and, and then also to be quite honest, Jack, cause you're like a sister to me. I, uh, I excelled at the beginning of this, I really did. I was working. I was inspiring people. I was motivating people. I was reaching out to people. You okay? Do you need an ear? And you know, the past four months, like I went down that fucking rabbit hole. You know, it's it's been it's been a lot more difficult. I've had I've I've found sometimes the sadness hard to shake, mm -hmm. um, hard to stay motivated, and the only thing that isn't compromised is my business and my children. Um, but other than that, like I'm drinking more than I used to drink. You know, it's tough. Like mental health is really tough for everybody. And, uh, 
you know, it's just, I just say persevere, like God willing, this will end, this too shall pass, yada, yada, yada. I just don't know when. I know. I see a light at the end of the tunnel, though. We're going to get through it. Yeah, you, you're in the States. You get vaccines. We're in Canada. There's like, there's no procurement. You can't even, you can't even get a PS5 here. Forget a vaccine. <laughs> just get in your car and drive to Chicago. We're taking a quick break. Now we are going to shift into the casting side of things. So I want you to talk a little bit about what has changed in the pandemic, Let's talk about self-tapes, all of that. Okay. Um, it's changed a lot. I'll tell you one thing I'm proud of is I'm proud of the way that, you know, the industry here in Canada and Toronto has, has adjusted. Like, we're still working, and uh, we're working constantly. Now, we're doing half the amount of work we used to do, and it's taking us double the amount of time. But there's a lot of care taken on sets. And our union, which is actor, is now mandating that all productions must have COVID testing um, we're doing that for the non-union ones as well. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very passionate about this. You know, um, some people think I overreact at times perhaps, but like I don't do, if a job comes in and they want to do like live, re like live recalls in the studio or they're not going to do COVID testing or they're going to shoot the people close, six feet or closer, I simply won't do the job. Right. Because I'm... I have enough shit on my, on my, you know, my mother did a number on me when I was a kid. <laughs> I got enough guilt. God forbid. I don't want, I love you, mom. I'm just joking. Um, I don't want that in my life. I don't want to put anybody at risk. And so I've, I've said no. And, you know, there was, you know, there have been jobs, one specifically where I actually took money out of my budget to cover COVID testing. That's how important it is to me. Mm -hmm. um, Good. And, and it upsets me when I hear about like these, there are these recalls, but you know, the clients and the directors aren't there. And it's like, I just feel like, well, if you're going to put everybody at risk, then you should put yourself at the same risk. Yeah. Just, you know, I just feel like we got to wait, wait this out. And then I would love to go back to using my office. But the process has become really, I don't want to say easy, but we've really adjusted to it. Like mm -hmm. we've done, we've done since COVID, I've done probably about 150 jobs all online. And, you know, it's difficult um, we'll talk about the cons, like, you know, what we talked about before. But the thing that, that is great is that you have a lot of people in your extended family that all of a sudden are on TV because we're doing bubble family. Right, right, exactly. Kid, like, all of a sudden, people are getting headshots and people are acting. And, and I love that. And it's a lot of fun. And a lot of people are enjoying the process. Um, it's difficult because you can't fabricate the same energy on Zoom that you have in person. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't you know, you can't do a dentine ice commercial where people are kissing because you'll just cover up the camera, kissing the camera like this. Um, 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 uh, right. So, um, you know, and, and just like, you know, even with dialogue, you know, sometimes if the internet isn't strong enough, it gets choppy. I mean, mm -hmm. those are some of the challenges, but there are, there are certain things that all actors can be doing that some haven't where I find it very frustrating because we're now like 11 months in it's time to adapt. And I'm not, I understand that getting a proper mic or getting a, a ring light or getting a tripod, like I understand that these things all come at a, at a cost and right now people aren't making a lot of money. But again, over the last 11 months, there, there are some people that have, shown, that have not really done that and it makes it very difficult, you know, because there are people I know that they're going to come on a Zoom recall and I know that their, their internet is going to suck, they're going to be choppy. And, and basically we just say, okay, um, here's the direction, send us a self-tape. And the director can't work with them. And, it's, yeah. and, and also being aware of your lighting. Like, these are little things that aren't expensive. Like, you know, if this is what you want to do, then do it right, you know? Mm -hmm. I tell my actors, too, it's like when they used to come in with a headshot resume and there was, like, coffee spilled on it or it was, like, the scissors, the paper was all torn up. It's like, that's a reflection on you. So if it's the same thing with these self-tapes. If you can't put a lamp behind your computer or anything, like, find a way to make it work. That's it. And, and I understand there are times where some of the self tapes are a little bit more complicated. And I understand the frustration that actors feel. Trust me, I do. Um, especially now when like a lot of like when we're really busy, like there's a lot of actors like my best friend, Andrew, you know, one week have like five or six self tapes. It's a lot to get through. It's a lot. Oh, to right. edit. It's a lot to do. But you're doing it. And you want this is what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Although the process isn't perfect. Um, the performance is on point and we're getting it done. Mm -hmm. and the spots are getting done. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, like, is this going to be the way it is? Like, I know in, in the financial and other sectors of the world, like, offices are kind of not really needed anymore, you know, because we are so, you know, in touch with one another. But in casting, 
the intimacy of reading off of somebody, of improv of playing off of somebody, like it's so vital, but yet we're doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, just, I would just tell all actors like, you know, whatever you gotta do, like just get, get the ring light, you know, if, you know, get a Wi-Fi booster, also be aware in your house, there's some places where the Wi-Fi is stronger. Mm -hmm. um, switch to data, like, and, and like if you're a parent or an adult, like, Make sure when you log on, like you don't have your kid's Scooby-Doo background and like you're like, I don't know how to take this off, right? <laughs> and, you know, and you know, the camera has to be horizontal, right? Is it vertical or horizontal? I don't it's think. horizontal. Yeah, and some people don't know that. Like just these little things. Little that, things. Little things that make, you know, a difference. We're not expecting perfection. You're in your living room. You're not wearing pants. It's okay, <laughs> you know? Like, right. There's a, there's a lot of elasticity here and forgiveness, but just like Wi-Fi, lighting, and getting the self tape in on time or when you're doing a zoom recall you know make sure my big thing is like the clutter in the background like when they have like yeah. dirty laundry in the back of their self tape or you know stuff like that it's just little things that right. they can adjust right some of those i actually it's really funny to just sort of see what people have on their walls like <laughs> i have one friend i didn't know he liked all these old sailboats as much as he did all these pictures <laughs> dude but you know, again, just like you want to give yourself an opportunity. The same thing applies as before this, you know, like know your lines, know the scene, ask the questions, ask your agent, know the wardrobe, you know, have have decent Wi-Fi. That's the most important thing. Like, mm -hmm. it's crazy. So and with that, you should be fine. And like, I don't have a ring light because um, I don't audition, but you do. I mean, how much is a ring light? It, it was like 60 bucks on Amazon. So it's it's not terrible. Mm -hmm. It's not, not terrible. And it's there's not, probably cheaper ones too, because they have all different kinds, so. Right. And you don't need, most people don't need mics like we have. Mm -hmm. Like just have a light and, and, you know, have a tripod for your phone or your iPad and just do your thing. It's, it's not that difficult. It's a bit of a pain in the ass, but right. it's doable. So if you're not gonna do it, tell your agent, I don't wanna be submitted. Why waste everybody's time? Yeah, okay, yeah. moving along. Yeah. We're gonna do one question, more question, and then we're gonna play a game. So okay. I want you to share one secret or one bit of advice that you have never shared before? Oh, Jesus. Uh, one, <laughs> well, you know, I, I immediately am gravitating to the advice because I got some secrets. I don't know how much I want to divulge. But yes, give us your secrets. Oh, shit. Honest to God, you, put, you totally put me on the spot. I love That's putting you on the spot. A secret. Um, oh, God. I'm an open book. I can't think of anything. Um, okay, fine. It could be something that you have shared before, but maybe you just don't say a lot. Um, uh, <laughs> I've, I'm, I've never been speechless. I'm literally, like, I'm searching the database. I want to give you something really good. I'm like looking around like, what, did I do anything over there? Uh, I had my first Christmas tree this year. I'm a Jew. I had a Christmas tree. I bought one. That's Wait, pretty, me too. That's I had my first Christmas tree too i've never had one before i loved it in fact i just took it down like a couple of weeks ago it was very nice the way it lights up i got it off of amazon so there's a secret <laughs> uh, i have way worse than that i just can't think of them okay. uh, yeah a lot of my secrets don't involve horticulture i have other stuff i'll just i'll private message you okay Let's do our final segment, which is called Let's Make Waves, aka Spilling the Tea. So it's going to be a flash round. So I want you to say the first thing that comes to your mind as soon as I ask the question. So put, it's improv. You're, you're an improv master. No, okay. And, 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 and you can edit. So that's great. Okay. Hit me. <laughs> All right. Hottest celebrity you ever met? Fuck, why am I going blank? I haven't, uh, hottest celebrity I've ever met. <laughs> um, most of the celebrities that I've ever met that I've been like sort of taken back or like kind of fanned out on have been rappers and they've all been men so that's okay it's a weird like, no uh, okay well well, what, the question is who was the sexiest what did you say yeah, who was the hottest celebrity you ever met okay well as far as hot no but the coolest thing I got to do was about five years ago, I had invested in a record label called Jamla Records with Ninth Wonder. And there's a, a rapper by the name of Rhapsody who's become a very big yeah. uh, rapper. I was, you know, I spent, you know, a couple weekends in studio with them in, in, uh, in North Carolina and got to watch them work and make beats and, and go to a, the A3C uh, hip hop festival in Atlanta and just part of their crew. And it was just like, 
I met Talib Kweli, I met Master Ace, I met like so many rappers and I, it was just like, I was like totally, I never fan out like, right. I have like Tom Cruise coming in and read like a fucking Brand Flakes commercial and I won't twitch. <laughs> but this shit, this shit, I was shook. Like, I was, right. like, really, like, excited. Okay, so that's my answer. <laughs> okay, back to the game. Most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you at work? Most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me at work? Oh, uh, like There has to be a lot. Oh, there's so yeah. many things. Well, one thing that happened to me, which was so awful, is I was doing this callback. It, it actually didn't happen at work. I was at home, and I had emailed the producer on Monday night saying, here's our final recall list. I'll see you on Wednesday. No problem. I said, and then, and then I woke up the next morning, Tuesday morning, uh, and I'm like, hey, dude, I'm working from home. If you need me, I'm not going to the office today. You know, just reach out. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? The callbacks start at 10. And I was just like, uh, oh, my God. And, I, and this is when I first started. And I didn't have Sarah. And I was a really small company that, at that point. And I remember calling my mom because I couldn't negotiate. How am I going to get into a shower, get into my car, um, and get all these and call talent. So I called my mom. I was like fucking crying. I was like having an anxiety attack. And you know, I'm in the car. And my mom's like, I got all the people. I got all the people. I got all the people. And I was like, oh my god, that was the worst thing in my casting career that has ever happened. Because that's the worst feeling in the world. When oh, you're powerless, right? Yeah. Like I've had weird things like that happen before, where it's like. You mix up the talent or the, I don't know, something where it just, it doesn't. It's scary because the same thing applies for us as it does for actors. Like people remember what you don't do well rather than what you do do well. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the, the tough thing about this business. You can, you know, hit the landing, you know, nine out of 10 times, but that 10th time you really piss off the wrong person or fuck up a job. People want to, there has to be accountability. So right. that's never happened since, thank God, because I, that was the worst feeling. Okay, moving along. Name one item you cannot live without. Uh, right now, it, it would be wine. Probably like Bordeaux or Barolo, red wine. Um, and hip hop music. Yes. And music. That's the one thing that like when I don't have my son and like no, I'm, I'm just able, I'm finished my work, I'll just get, get some wine. I'll just like go on, you know, Spotify. And it just, I just go through, you know, you, artists similar to, and you just wind up like you're three hours in and your neck hurts from bobbing, like it's great. Do you want to show everyone your, all of your hip hop tattoos? We, I went with you to get how many tattoos? One or two? I think two. Uh, uh, you went with me. I had uh, the Nipsey Hustle one. I had Nipsey written on me here. That's Gangstar, that's Mob Deep, uh, Sean Price, Big L, MF Doom, rest in peace. Uh, public Enemy, I've got Wu-Tang up here. I've got, yeah, but you and I went for two tattoos and then we tried to get your nose pierced. Oh my God, we have to tell this story. We have to tell this story. Uh, we, we all went, we left the CMTC because we had the afternoon off. We, I wanted to get a tattoo and I had convinced you to get a nose ring because I had gotten a nose ring. And you acted as if like they were literally removing your liver. No, like, I didn't do the nose ring. I, I did my belly button. Oh, that's right, the belly button. And they wanted me to get a nose ring, but then I was like, I'll do the belly button because I had that's it before. Right. That's right. And you freaked out. Like, you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to faint. Oh, my God, I'm going to faint. And, like, you, like, literally was like they were playing operation on you. Like, you were so over the top, freaked out. And, I had a like, panic they attack. You had a terrible panic attack. But and it was. And a fan. Yeah. It, it should, honestly, it could have been a pay per view special. Like, it was so. <laughs> I felt bad for you, but it was really, it was great for the viewer. It was pretty because, funny. It was pretty funny. Honestly, like, it didn't hurt that much. No, no, no. I think the lady, like, fucked up because the first time I got a pierce, it didn't hurt at all. And the second time, she, like, did something wrong because it, like, tore through my skin. Okay, all right. Now, so that's why I almost fainted. Okay, right. moving along. If you could trade places with one living person, who would it be? Oh, Jesus. One living person. Uh, that I could trade places with. It has to be a rapper, right? I, I kind of, um, I would probably say, uh, yeah, it would be somebody in the hip hop community. I would probably say, like, I really admire, you know, Jay-Z, Puff Daddy, you know, these guys that have really become moguls and they started like from the ground up, you know, mm -hmm. with really cutting edge music that really reflected where they came from and where they were at to now. Like, I don't, like Jay-Z is real bougie now. Like, I don't really mess with his music anymore, but I totally, respect him as an entrepreneur and as a humanitarian um there are a lot of guys i mean i used to love 
dream of having my own record label just because hip hop music brings me so much joy and R and B music as well. Like music is life. It just, it brings us up and you know, there are albums and songs that I register memories to as a young man. Like it's just very important to me. So I think you will one day have your own. Who knows? I'm going to try something. I mean, I've been sitting once this pandemic is over, I think once we get our hugs out, I think we're all going to go back to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, greatest single achievement in your career. In my career, okay, in my career, I'd say just like having 10 years of growth and going from having no money to doing well and just seeing the change in my life and money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys a lot of other shit mm -hmm. and it really helps. And it also affords you the opportunity to help other people. And, you know, again, I grew up, you know, modest and you know, I love to help other people. Um, I do a lot of fundraisers. I just, it feels really good to do for other people. And uh, I also miss that as well. That's but what I big... love so much about you. You're always helping other people and giving back to your like, community. Yeah, I love it. And I love doing like fundraisers for the Red Door Shelter, which is a women's shelter. We do Thanksgiving dinner for them. And I, I fund it. Like, I don't mind because I do have the money, which is great. Um, but on a personal level, my biggest achievement would be my son, Isaiah. Um, only because I actually carried him to term, which is crazy. Like I was, I, was, <laughs> I mean, everybody thought it was just beer. I'm like, no, no, no. I, I, I have a son. I'm going to my water. Oh, so cute. You guys yeah. are twins. Yeah. He's, he's, that's the greatest thing in my life. Like if it wasn't for, and I have another, an elder son too, who's incredible, who I adore. He's away in Montreal. If it wasn't for my kids. I don't know how I would have gotten through this. Honest to God, like. For those that are that are alone and by themselves, I have tremendous empathy and compassion for you. Fucking hang in there. Reach out to the people that, that you love and that you know love you. You're not a burden. Mental health is real. It's realer than it's ever been. There are people that are so aware of it now because of what we've been through. Everything from racial injustice to alt right to all the shit, because we get your media, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put on CNN and then I'll go on Fox. I'm like, what fucking country is this? Like, it's one country in two parts. Mm -hmm. And thing is, as I say, before all this shit happened, go back to 2019, people felt this way when shit was good, you know? So be compassionate, be empathetic, reach out to people. People are struggling. I've struggled. I've reached out to people. This is God willing the hardest thing that we're ever going to have to endure as, as um, a civilization, because, you know, we all were shook when 9-11 happened. Like that was a groundbreaking moment, mm -hmm. but you know, this is just unbelievable. Like what humanity has had to endure and process over the last year. Oh man, it's really sad. So, you know, and then on a lighter note. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I know. <laughs> but sorry, it's going to be okay. Da -da 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 -da. And my next question. Yeah. Favorite alcoholic beverage? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I started with box wine just because I liked how much the box had. But then I realized that the taste is really crappy. So uh, I, I don't compromise on wine. I like Bordeaux and Barolo. And I, and I like to drink a lot of it if I can. Yes. Um, okay, last question. Give me more. Biggest splash you've ever made in the industry because we're making waves. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, the biggest splash I've ever made. You know what? I think for me personally, um, the biggest splash that I made as far as where I guess myself was in the public figure was um, a few years ago, I did a really big concert in Toronto called Light Up the Night with my friend Geraldine. Um, and there was a shooting in downtown Toronto. There was like some extreme sort of guy and he just was out on the street. It was a summer, people are eating ice cream and he, he killed some people. And one of which was a little girl and she was out with her family eating ice cream. And I just, it just hit me so hard because the night before I was with my son at Greg's ice cream, sitting outside and having an ice cream. And I thought our, Toronto as a whole was so wounded. So we did this light up the night concert and it was this moment and I'll send you footage of it. We were on I all the clips on Facebook. It was how we held a vigil in this park 
And everybody, you know, at the end of that, we had entertainers, we had comedians, we had performances, we had all kinds of ceremonies. And the attention that it got, that I remember when everybody, you know, lit their, their flames to light up the night, I just started crying. I couldn't control myself because it was so powerful. And, and everybody felt such a, a sense of healing. And I felt I've never accomplished anything even close. And to this day, the film festival was one thing. Other th this was something that was so special because it brought a whole community of people that didn't even know each other. And the funny thing is, is like, I, like I paid for it out of pocket, but people donated stuff. Like we had a stage, Jack. We had like- It was a full concert. The full, it looked like a mini Lola Palooza type of thing. It really like, did. It really yeah, did. Yeah, like porta potties from, from, you know, everybody helped, the police helped us, everybody. And I remember it was like, the summertime, so it wasn't dark, and I'm looking around like it was kind of sparsely crowded. And I remember going around to my friend Geraldine and my mom, my sister, and I'm like, "Who the fuck is everybody? Like, we put so much money, we've done so many interviews, so much media." And as soon as the light like started to, was, the sun started to come down, I look out, and it was a stream of people walking towards the stage, and I'll never forget that moment. It was really that is the greatest accomplishment of my life. Wow. Uh, well, you inspire me, and I'm so happy that you came on. I love you. Your, your ring light went off. Oh, perfect timing. Um, <laughs> where can everybody follow you? Um, well, you know, if, if you're on, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Uh, Instagram is man casting. If you're local and you're listening to it, I have a casting group on Facebook, man casting. I post a lot of my jobs there. Um, I'm, a, I'm very accessible. Um, if anybody has any questions or thoughts or whatever, you just want to say hi, like I'm here, I got you. And I just want to tell everybody to stay safe, stay up. This will pass you know, love those who love you and uh, and, and be there for them and, and, and expect the same. Thank you so much. I love you. Well, you're Thank the best you. and I love you.